everything about our lives is intentional. There's not one thing that you went through that was not intentional. God doesn't cause things, but God necessarily doesn't always stop things either. Why is it that God allows some things to get through? Notice I said some things because we often get caught up in the one or two bad things that got through and stop giving God praise for the thousands of things he stopped. But throughout life, there are things that, that crept through, things that happened to all of us, some as children, some as teenagers. For some, it was in your 20s or your 30s or your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you name it. I want to make sure I have everybody covered. But why does God allow things to creep in? Well, it's because before it's all said and done, it will work together for our good because he has a plan for it. In a lot of ways, what you've gone through in life is your qualifier. You wouldn't reach for God the way you reach for God if that didn't happen. You wouldn't pray the way you pray if it wasn't for that person leaving or for that person hurting you or abusing you. You, you wouldn't seek the Lord with all the ways that you seek the Lord today if it wasn't for that moment. So God has a way of knowing exactly what we will need so when the time comes and he calls our name, we didn't find God God found us. God called our name. And when the time came that God called your name, you were ready and you would never turn back because you would have the fuel required to fight the enemy with everything that you have inside of you. But everything is intentional. Everything is for purpose. We are not fumbling through life. We are not just going through the motions every single day. This is why the psalmist said, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because it may not be the day that I step into my blessing. It may not be the day I meet the man. It may not be the day I meet the woman. It may not be the day I get the job or get the approval uh, for the credit that I'm trying to get. No, but Every day I get out of bed is on purpose, and every day I get out of bed, I do know this. It may not be the day, but I am one step closer to the day. Did you know when you woke up today, you are one step closer to the thing that you believe is going to bring happiness to your life? As a matter of fact, put that in the chat room, I'm one day closer Yes, I am one day closer. If you were not one day closer, you would not be breathing right now. But if you are breathing, if you've gotten through the day on the East Coast, it is 6.39 p.m. If you made it to 6.39 p.m., that is not by accident. It is because wherever you are, God has purpose for your life. And so what I want to do over the next several weeks is I want to go back about 10,000 years, give or take. Some may think a little longer as I'm going to talk about tonight, but I want to go back at least 10,000 years to, to the Garden of Eden. I want to go back to the first man and the first woe man or woman that would be created because there is so much to unravel and so much we can learn about purpose through the life of Adam and Eve. In particular, as we're going to talk about tonight, Adam. We are placed for purpose. Well, what's the first point that I really want to sit on tonight? Well, number one, I want to talk about this. The preparation for my placement. The preparation for my placement. Nobody watching tonight has ever eaten a good meal that was just thrown together quickly. I've never eaten something that was amazing that was put together in five minutes. The greater the meal, the greater the preparation. I've had steaks that have been being prepared for six months. 
five months. They cost a grip. Why? Because the greater the preparation, the greater the worth. The greater the cost because it's requiring greater time. You wonder why your blessing, why it feels like your purpose is taking so long. Could it be that God is saying that when I'm done, you're going to be an aged stake? Could it be that when God sees you, there's great worth, but great worth is tied to great time and great waiting? And you want something quick, but whenever you say, God, give me something quick, what you are really saying is, I am something cheap. Just like a bottle of fine wine, it gets better with age. It's not that God is torturing you. It's just that God is preparing something for you. He is preparing the blessing for you and you for it. And the two have to go together. It's not always that something is wrong with you. It could be that the thing is not ready for you. And you keep saying, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? It could be that nothing is wrong with you. You could be right where you need to be, but what you want is not ready for you. It's twofold. So the first thing I, I want to see tonight as we jump into this is that the blessing, the purpose, the destiny, whatever you want to call it, it is being prepared for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says this. It is written, I have not seen nor ear heard. Neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Before we move forward, we have to do a love check. Do you love God? It seems like an easy question. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You do not love what you do not give to. Do you love God? That's what God is looking for. Love, 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 love. He says, if you love me. So to every God lover. Remember when Peter messed up. What's the three questions Jesus asked Peter over and over and over? He said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Why? Because it doesn't matter how far you've fallen if you still love God. If you still love God, there's hope for your life. If you still love God, he can give you a comeback. If you still love God, Peter, you can preach the inaugural message of the church in 50 days or so because I don't care what you've done. I don't care who you hurt. I don't care what you even did to me. As long as you love me, there's still hope for your life. This is a love thing for God works all things together for the good of those, yes, who are called, but those who love him. Before we move forward tonight, who do you love? Do you love God? Because Paul says, for everybody that loves God, there's some things coming into your life that I have not seen. To everybody that loves God, there's some things coming into your life that ears have not heard. There are some things that God has prepared for you. He has prepped for you. And as we're going to see tonight, sometimes God's prep is so long or so in the making that it has been happening for thousands and hundreds of thousand years or maybe even trillions of years before the doctor ever slapped your behind. There are things prepared. You mean to tell me everything God has for James Edward Tigg is already done? You mean to tell me I, I'm not praying for God to create a blessing for me? All I got to do is step into the blessing that's already been laid out for me. Yeah, the footsteps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. As God leads your life, he allows you to step into the stuff that has already been prepared for you. God has 
Paul says in verse 10, revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searches the deep things, yea, the deep things, the deep things, the deep things, and God allowed a, a deep sleep to come upon Adam. God allows the, the deep things of God. God is not shallow. I always know something's not for God for my life by how shallow it is. Shallow conversations, shallow habits. Whenever you meet a shallow person, you should start running in the other direction before your heart gets tied to them. Because God is in the deep places. But look at what it says here. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard. But God has revealed them to us, to me, to me. By his spirit. Stop letting people tell you what God has for you. If I haven't seen and ear hasn't heard, why would God bypass me and go to you? His spirit shows me what he has prepared for me. That's where we're going to sit a minute. His spirit shows me while we're into this and just getting started. If you know somebody that needs some encouragement, Paul's watching the message tonight and shoot them a text or send them the stream because th this, this is about to get gooder. As I used to say as a kid, this is about to get gooder. So the Spirit shows me what God has for me. Okay, how do I know what the Spirit is showing me? Well, Mark 11 says it like this. Whatever, whoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have them. You know, the spirit has told you something about your future or that something is for you concerning your future. One, by the fact that that you can speak to impossible things and not stop speaking till they move. I don't know what your impossible thing is. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's your business. Maybe it's a relationship. I, I don't know. Maybe it's your child. I don't, I don't know. But if you can stop speaking to it, you were never supposed to have it. The Bible says, even as an old man, Caleb said, give me my mountain. You know it's yours when you just can't stop claiming it. Some money's coming into my life. But look at your credit. I don't know where it's coming from. But I said it at 20. I'm still saying it at 30. I'll be saying it at 40 and 50. You know, I, I'm called to have a child. I don't know who's going to be the one. I don't know how it's going to happen. Maybe I'll be like the Virgin Mary. But God showed me I'm going to have not an adopted child. No, 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 no. Not, not, not a child put into me by somebody. No, 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 no. I'm going to have my own baby. God showed me that. I believe it. If you can stop talking about it, then go adopt a child. But when God speaks to you, I'm going to be married. I don't know where he's coming from. I don't know how it's going to happen. And that also goes along with the person that says, I'm going to have a child. Don't go out trying to experiment to have a child. You know, just got to clarify that a little bit. But what God has for you, I'm going to get this business off the ground. I'm going to get this ministry off the ground. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to keep giving it my all. I'm going to give it my all when I'm sick. I'm going to give it my all when I'm broken. I'm going to give it my all when I'm depressed. I'm going to give it my all when my back is hurting. I'm going to give it my all when my hips and my knees are hurting. I'm going to give it my all when I got a headache. I'm going to give it my all when I'm paralyzed, when I'm, when I'm deathly ill. I don't care. I don't care what my situation is, whether I'm divorced or burying somebody. I am never going to stop speaking to my mountain. And he says, if you desire it and you believe when you pray, it's yours. And what he's saying is, the Holy Spirit shows you what's yours through desire. The psalmist said, trust in God. He will give you the desires of your heart. Desire. What do you desire? Stop letting people tell you that what you desire is wrong. As long as what you desire aligns with the word, chase it. 
Now I have protocols in place in case it's the devil because don't get it twisted. I could be in the garden, you know, lessons from the garden. I'm going to talk more about this in the coming weeks, but don't get it twisted. The devil will move in your garden. And there is a very close resemblance between the devil and God's voice when you're in a wilderness. The, the devil knows his word so often he will package what he's telling you to, to do with the word. It is written, has not God said so? I like to have boundaries like one, God will confirm his word by the mouth of two or three people. Two, I never make a decision unless my spiritual leadership approves it. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, the Bible says. Even when I'm angry, the person that I've held or given power to hold me accountable, I know that if it's God's will, he will touch their heart to give me a thumbs up to move forward. But just because they say no in a season doesn't mean that I missed it. It may just mean that I need to pray some more and wait on God to change their heart. Because it could be that God is using them, not because I still need to be prepared, so, but so that I don't jump into my blessing before it is prepared and destroy it. Think about that. So it is prepared for you. We're talking about lessons from the garden. The Bible says that God works everything after the counsel of his will. Everything means everything. So God is working it out for you. In Genesis chapter 1, it's a Bible study, so we're going to have some Bible study tonight too. But in Genesis chapter 1, it says this. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So check this out. Earth and heaven are the same age. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Same age. But I thought God created the earth way after heaven. No. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And it was a perfect heaven and a perfect earth. Why do I know it was a perfect heaven and a perfect earth? Well, Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is not the author of confusion. So God would not have created a chaotic earth and a perfect heaven. So what happened? Well, in between Genesis 1, as we go back to it, and Genesis 2, it is called the gap. And this gap could be trillions of years, hundreds of millions of years, See, what I love about God is that science and theology will never differ. As far as what they find and what they prove, they, they always go hand in hand with the Bible. And when they don't, the Bible wins. So there's no guarantees that do not coincide with the Bible. But there are moments that we misread the Bible and we sound foolish. And so in between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, it's called the gap theory. It's, some say, a, a trillion years. Some say a billion years, you know. But we do know this, that earth and heaven are the same age. So what happened? The other side of that is, is as we get into the six days of creation, we're talking about God preparing the setting for Adam. The scripture lets us know that one day to God is a thousand years. So even with the, the six day or seven day creation theory, six days God created, the seventh day he rested, there is a strong belief that that would have been 6,000 years. Which makes a little bit more sense when you look at the order of things. But let's talk about this. What happened between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2? Genesis 2 says the earth was without form 
and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. On day one, what did God do? God separated the light from the darkness. Now understand, he did not create the sun and the moon as we normally read it. He did not even create that till what? Day four. So what is he doing on day one with separating light from darkness? Whenever you see light being separated from darkness, once again, it is not the sun and the moon being created. Light being separated from darkness is spiritual. What about the earth represented spiritual warfare? Stretching you a little bit tonight. And somebody could say, man, Pastor, you are completely wrong. And I will take that. We will agree to disagree. <laughs> but there are as many scriptures to prove what I'm saying as can, that can compete against what I'm saying. We're talking about God preparing the earth for Adam. So Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 says this about Satan. We're talking about spiritual Warfare, because we really cannot understand all that God has for you until we understand all the spiritual warfare that God had to fight through to get you. So in Isaiah 14, 12, it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now, Lucifer had fallen before Adam and Eve, because how could he come into the garden and tempt them? Think about that. So Satan fell before Adam and Eve were created. So he says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Hold up. What nations did Satan weaken before Adam and Eve? Think about it. He says, he or thou which did weaken the nations. What nations did Satan weaken before Adam and Eve? Before he fell? He couldn't weaken heaven's nations. He says, oh, ye that weaken the nation." What nations? We're going to go a little deeper with this. Second Peter, New Testament, Peter talks about this in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5. He says, For this they willingly are ignorant, that by the word of God heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was. What world that then was? This is not talking about Noah, because Noah's name is not mentioned. The world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. What we see happening here is the Bible says that when Satan came forth, darkness or when God started creating, darkness covered the face of the deep. What was the darkness? Well, the darkness goes back to a teaching that's called the pre-Adamaic era. And that was the world before Adam and Eve that Satan was the shining star of, that Satan controlled. And when he went against God, not only was it flooded, but the darkness that covered the deep was the darkness from the judgment of what Satan did. Okay, take it a little bit further. Where do you think we get demons from? I know we don't hear a lot of teaching about demons, but where do you think 
we get demons from. Demons are not fallen angels, for nowhere in the Bible can an angel possess a person. What are demons? Well, most believe that demons are the souls of the first world. Stick with me. They are the souls of the first world. This is why in Revelations, read Revelations, it says that those that are in the, world, in the water will be judged first. So they believe they are the souls of the people from the first world. When Jesus cast the demons out of the pigs, where did the pigs jump into? The water. They went back home. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. The Bible always backs itself. It says, I beheld the earth. What earth? The, her the earth that was created with heaven. I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void. This is Genesis 1, Genesis 2. And they had no light. Remember, what did God say? Let there be light. They had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled the hills, they moved lightly. I behold, lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. All the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Why was he angry? Because of what Satan did. And what Satan led the world into. I'll give you two more. Isaiah 24, 1. Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. He maketh it waste. He turns it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Isaiah's talking about the world that Satan messed up. And lastly, Job chapter 38 says, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Hold on. Job is saying here, when God started creating, the stars were singing. Not, not the angels, because the angels are the sons of God. The stars were singing. How can the stars sing if based upon what we've been taught, the stars were created on day four? Or could it be that they were not created on day four, but they were revealed on day four? This is the age when dinosaurs and all of that stuff would run wild. And if I had a little bit more time, I would talk about how, look at how strategic God was even for where the world is today. For if there were no dinosaurs, where would we get all of the fossil fuel from? God is a God that prepares he prepared a hundred million years ago for the car you would drive today. That's how in tune God is with every detail. He said, I know the hairs on your head. They are all numbered. And that does not mean as one falls off, he knows the number drops. No, when you lose a hair, God says that was hair number 989 that just fell out. Every hair is numbered. God is so in tune with every part of the process that he knows exactly every number to every hair on your body. If he knows where the birds are and where the lilies are, you don't think that he's prepared for you? God is into the details. And the Bible says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. I know that a person does not have the mind of God when they are not concerned even about the smallest of details. Because to be like God means that everything matters because God is a God that prepares. 
Where are we going with this? I want you to see how much preparation God had and what took place before Adam and Eve ever stepped onto the scene. I want you to see that even when they fell in the garden, God knew they were going to fall because they were not the first sinner Satan was. And Satan led the first world into sin. Adam and Eve did not create sin. Sin was in the world they stepped into. And if sin was in the world they stepped into, do you think it surprised God when they bit the bait? Much like it didn't surprise God when you bit or bite the, 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 the fruit or the bait. He has a plan. And nothing catches God off guard. The world was created for Adam and Eve. Day one, he said, let there be light. And he separated the light from the darkness. Day, day two, it says he separated the sky from the sea. And I've taught this over the years. You know that God is setting something up in your life when he's beginning to divide things and separate things. Relationships are beginning to separate Friendships are beginning to separate. Habits are beginning to separate. Desires are beginning to separate. It's an indication that light and darkness are beginning to move in your life. And God is making room for what he's about to do long before you ever get a chance to know him. Can you look back over your life and see how Things began to separate, or I'll put it this way. Things began to break apart, break apart. You had a breakup that led you to Jesus. That was God separating the sea from the sky. Setting you up for day three. What happened on day three? Resurrection. It's when he spoke to the earth and it rose out from the ocean. Why did it rise up from the ocean? He didn't create it on day three. Read your Bible. He spoke to that which was in the dead water and it came forth. It was a baptism that took place on day three. Wait a minute. Who rose from the tomb on day three? Day three points to resurrection. Day three is a shadow of the Jesus that will come one day. Day three is a, a prophecy about the you that would come forth one day. And he said to the earth that came forth, the earth that already was from the perfect earth he created before. And he said, bring forth fruit of yourself. The seed was already there. Why? Because the earth already had vegetation and fruit within it. Much like you can never make a person become what's not already in them. When God raises you from the grave, he expects for there to be fruit, bear fruit, Jesus said. If you're connected to the vine and you are a branch, you will bear much fruit. God expects for a resurrected person to have fruit in their life. If you don't have fruit, it's probably because you're still in the dead water. He expects for there to be fruit. The seed was within itself. He didn't create trees and fruit and grass and bushes on on day three it was already there he already did the preparing so that when adam would come forth the process would be suddenly the process would be immediately that's why when god starts moving it starts happening so fast he was already setting the, the setting the tone for you coming forth way before you ever had your resurrection this is good news so he pulled the earth out. It was resurrection. And, and then he, he revealed, read the original Hebrew. It doesn't say he created. It says he baja, he, he revealed the, the, star, the sun and the moon. It was already there. We just couldn't see it. 
Let's take this to the New Testament. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard. There's so much that you couldn't see. It's not that God didn't already prepare it. It's just that you were in so much water and in so much darkness, you couldn't see all that God had made for you. But once you walked in that resurrected life, now you're beginning to see things that you couldn't see before, hear things you couldn't hear before. This speaks to the ascended life, day four. Day five, God begins to create birds in the sky he separated, fish in the water, places that could not normally bring forth life on their own. God is now bringing forth life by his power. This in a lot of ways speaks to the blessings of the believer. The dead life that had no power to bring forth blessings in the past is now experiencing what it looks like when God is speaking things into your present. And then you get to day six and he creates the land animals, the land animals speak to the life before the rapture. It's God bringing life on the earth he created. And if I had more time, I would get into how Adam speaks to our resurrected cells and Jesus coming back and giving us a perfect body made in his image. God has been creating to every person that says, where is God? God is working. God is working. He is working so much harder than you. He rested on the seventh day to get ready for you. He is working. Jesus is praying, making intercession for us always. There is so much work. The spirit inside of you, the Holy Spirit is getting you ready. It is a cycle taking place, even though you don't realize that the Spirit is working in you. Jesus is praying for you, and the Father is working on things for you. Even when it seems like nothing's happening, God loves you too much to leave you where you are. So he's preparing it for you. And then what else is he doing? He's preparing you. For it, Jeremiah said it like this, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. Before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Look at this. Before you came out of the belly, I knew you. If God knew me before I got started, it shouldn't surprise me that he's kept me in my journey. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. He knew Abraham at 70 and told him he'd have a child at close to, to 100. And guess what? Until that time came, nothing could happen to Abraham because God had a plan before he formed him in the belly. When God forms you, he sanctifies you. Sanctified means he set me apart. This is why you never quite fit in. This is why you were always at the bar kind of odd. This is why you were always at the party kind of uncomfortable. It was because he sanctified you. He put his mark on you. And even when you tried to get comfortable he allowed things that would have destroyed you to leave you before you could even leave it. He marked you. You are where you are today because God marked you. That's why that marriage didn't last. You were marked. He had better for you. That's why that relationship couldn't work out. You were marked. That's why that job, no matter how much you tried to keep it, they let you go. You were marked for something better. God never let you get comfortable in that which is not for you. You're sanctified. And he says, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. I spoke to your purpose. 
And when God spoke to your purpose, like he said, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be light, you know, let, let, let there be separation, let, let the earth resurrect, let, let the stars, let the moon, let the sun come forth, let, let the sky bring forth birds, let the, 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 the water bring forth fish. When, when God speaks, stuff has to happen because his word doesn't return to him void. Whatever God has spoken over your life is going to happen. So what's happening now? Having done all to stand, keep standing. Because if he spoke it, he can't lie. It's the one thing God can't do is lie. If he spoke it, he can't lie. So if he won't lie, what is he doing? He's working. He's working on that man you're praying for. You haven't even met him yet, but he's working on him. He's working on that woman that you've been fasting over. He's working. And even though she's not giving you the time of the day, don't get discouraged. He's working. He's working on that job that's going to call you. He's working. He's working on that family member that doesn't want Jesus right now. He is working. So don't lose faith. Keep speaking it as Jesus said. Keep walking on in it as Jesus said. And it's only a matter of time before what God ordained becomes your new normal. He is preparing you for it. Say, I'm being prepared. Yeah, I'm being prepared. But also, it's being prepared. Look, look at this, look at this. I love this scripture in Jeremiah chapter 18. As you turn there or, or, or pull up your other device to get there. I want to talk too about Moses. How, look at Moses' whole life. It was a life of preparation. He wasn't ready to lead the Hebrew people. So what did God do? He allowed him to be raised in Pharaoh's house. To get the best education. To learn about the materials that it would require to lead or would be required to build the tabernacle. He would send him back into the wilderness from 40 to 80, learning how to survive in the wilderness. Why did he have to go back into the wilderness for 40 years? He had to learn how to survive in the wilderness because he would have to lead people in the wilderness. You cannot lead people where you have not been. Egypt qualified him to build the tabernacle. His Failure at 40 qualified him to lead people through the wilderness. Why? Because it all works together for the good. And you'll see this with David, with the sheep, with Gideon at the press. God is always preparing people. Why do you think Mary knew to tell Jesus to turn the water into wine no mother would put her son in a spot to be embarrassed, especially with so much on the line with Jesus. She knew he could do it because she saw him practicing at the home. I can imagine Jesus in the bathtub and Mary would leave and Mary would come in and it would look like a mess of wine. I picture baby Jesus. You know, as Talladega Knight says, I picture my baby Jesus, you know. I picture baby Jesus turning water to wine in the bathtub. There are books that have been discovered that are not a part of our canons that, that have documentation of what people say from Nazareth and what people say in the years Jesus was in Egypt. There are books that, that account for what they say Jesus did when he was a child. I'm not saying they're the word of God. But what I'm saying is that Mary must have seen Jesus practicing to know that he was capable for the moment. Whenever you're in a season of waiting, you should also be in a season of practicing. I say this often and I'm moving on quickly and I didn't even get to my other two points that were planned tonight, but that's okay. We got some time in the coming weeks. But the one thing that you will see with God is that a person should not have to be a prophet to be able to tell where you're going. 
People should be able to tell where you're going by what you're working on right now. I know a person is called to be a leader in our church when they're always following my leaders around, asking them a million questions, asking them about serving, asking them about expectations, asking them about ministry, asking them about culture. That's the sign to me that a person is called to leadership. I know a person is called to marriage when they're beginning to be drawn to married people and not always hanging out with single people. Why? Because you're beginning to be drawn to where you're going. And that means you have to let go of everything that's tied to where you are. I know a person is called to have a great business when they're going to conferences and when they're hanging out with people that are higher than them and investing into moments that may seem foolish to people, but it makes sense to them because of where they're going. What can people see in your life right now that is a clear indicator of where you're going? Because if people can't see it, this time next year, you're going to be where you are tonight. It's time to change the game. And Jeremiah 18, as I bring this home tonight, says this. Jeremiah was peeking into what God was doing with his people. And it says, the word of the Lord from, to Jeremiah came, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. We're talking about the power of placement tonight, placed on purpose. He says, go down to the potter's house. There will I cause you to hear my words. See, when God causes you to go to a church, that becomes your potter's house. No pun intended. I'm not speaking about my spiritual mentor's church. <laughs> when God causes you to go to a place, it's because that is the place where you hear his words. That's why you invest in your ministry. That's why your ministry has great value to you. Because if the ministry shuts down, there will be a void in your life when it comes to hearing God's word. I tell our church this all the time. Nowadays with YouTube, church is like a buffet. You can go to everybody's YouTube channel and hear a different word. And that's okay. But those pastors are speaking to the people that are tied to them. And sometimes you can listen to somebody else's word and lose. When God calls you to a church, it is that church's word that has preeminence over every other thing in the buffet. Sometimes I'll take staff members or volunteers to this restaurant that maybe you've been to, maybe you haven't been to, but I like it. It's Fogo de Chao. And I'll never forget, I got so frustrated with somebody once because I took them to Fogo de Chao and they kept eating at the buffet that has like salads in potato salad and, you know, all these like corn and stuff like that. And they were eating nonstop that. I could have taken them anywhere else to have that stuff. I took them there to taste the meat, to flip their card green so that they could eat some lamb chops and so that they could eat some chicken and so that they could eat some different types of meat they, or steaks they've never had before. They're getting filled up off the corn off the potato salad that they could get from the grocery store. And that's what happens if we're not careful. We get so filled up with all the other preachers on YouTube and get filled up on the potato salad that when we come to church on Sundays, we're not coming for the steak that God has for our lives. Where God speaks to you that's where your life is going to experience transformation. And that's where your life is going to begin to experience God's power in your life. 
He says, there will I cause to hear my words. Where does God speak to you? And how much do you show God that you are grateful for it? He says, then I went down to the potter's house. And behold, I wrought a work on the wheels. When I was in position, I got a chance to see what God was doing. I saw a work on the wheels. And the vessel he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make it. Look at what's happening. I told you this is an illustration of God and his people. Jeremiah says, I went down to the potter's house and I witnessed God's process. I saw clay spinning on a wheel. Just because your life is spinning does not mean that you are not in God's hands. The clay is spinning. It's almost nauseating. It's spinning. One thing I don't do at carnivals and stuff like that, I don't get on spinning rides. Ever since I was a kid, if I get on spinning rides, I get lightheaded. But that's not the only reason. I don't like spinning rides for me because everything loose gets lost in the spin. See, I've learned with God, sometimes he has to let your life start spinning so everything loose in your life gets lost in the spin. He's preparing the clay to be used, to be admired, to be sold, to be cherished, to be valued. But it cannot be cherished. It cannot be used. It cannot be displayed as long as it resists the spin. This is where most people quit. Most people quit when things start spinning. So it's spinning. But here's what you got to understand. Because you can't spin and forget the importance of having the water applied in your life. The water is the word of God. If you're in the spin and you stop coming to church, what happens is, and this is so good, somebody better give an amazing offering for this right here tonight. When you don't put water in the spin, the clay gets hard and falls apart. You are hard in this season because you have not been getting enough word in your life. You are falling apart in this season. Because the spin is beginning to take a toll and the clay is beginning to fly everywhere because you have not been getting the water, the water in your life to keep the form together. And the earth was without what? Form. And if you don't have form, there will be a void. And when you do not have form and you have a void, there will be nothing but darkness that surrounds you. I'm okay on the spin as long as I know he has his hands on me and the water is coming into my life. That is why you're catching this Zoom. This, that is why you're catching this YouTube tonight. It is because you are saying, Lord, no matter how fast my life is spinning, I refuse to spin and not pause. There it is. And not pause on a Wednesday night to get this water in my life. I do not want my life to get hard and fall apart. So the clay is spinning, but it's in his hands. It's in his hands. Always know this, as God is preparing you for it, he will never take his hands off you. But it is your job to get the water on you. He cannot form you without water. So in the spin, know this. There is never a second of the day where God's hand is not on your life. 
but there could be seconds of the day that you are not prioritizing God's water in your life. So as God is preparing you for it, you have the responsibility to walk by faith and not by sight. Believe those things that you desire. Walk by faith and not by sight. And show God that, Lord, no matter how out of control the spin is, I know that you're working, so I will not allow the devil to put me in a place where I stop prioritizing and I stop getting this water in my life. Jeremiah says, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. You are being prepared for purpose. And God is getting you ready for your purpose as we will see Adam. And God is getting your purpose ready for you.